Hi, welcome to Cybrary CISSP training. My name is Kelly Handerhan and I am your subject matter expert. Uh, I have various uh, certifications in the information security field, of course the CISSP cert, also CompTIA's Advanced Security Practitioner. I have several certifications across various platforms, Cisco, uh, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, uh, also specializing in project management from an IT standpoint. So I've got a solid background. I've been in this business for going on about 20 years, worked in both the public and private sector. And hopefully what we're going to do is we're going to break down the 10 domains of the CISSP exam as well as provide you with a few test taking tips. This is a great certification to have, very valuable in this, in uh, in this industry, so I hope you're successful with the material. All right, now, what we're going to be covering uh, throughout the class, as you're probably aware of, the CISSP exam is broken up into 10 domains or areas of knowledge. This is certainly not an everything you ever wanted to know about IT security class. This really is very specifically focused on what it takes to pass the CISSP exam. So ISC Square has uh, pulled from the common body of knowledge, which really includes hundreds of different topics and they've arranged those topics in 10 different domains on which you'll be tested. Now, the material that we'll cover uh, in this particular class, we're going to start out this morning with information security governance and risk management. Not all domains on this exam are treated equally, meaning, okay, it's got 250 questions, you might think, well, that's going to map out to 25 questions per topic. Not at all. Uh, some domains are much higher weighted, and we'll talk about why that is and, and how to make your assumption. But let me tell you, information security governance and risk management, probably the single most testable topic on the domain. And that's very valid. And if you look at it, information security governance, all decisions flow from senior management, top-down management flowing down throughout the organization. So there's your governance piece. But risk management. Risk management is the foundation for every decision that we make. Okay? So if you look at the remaining domains, if you were trying to, to uh, figure out which domain does risk management not factor into, factors into every single domain. What type of cryptographic algorithm should I use? What type of media from a telecommunication standpoint? Or what sort of protocols? What sort of network connectivity devices? Uh, business continuity married to risk management. So this is really the foundation of everything that we do, which is exactly why we talk about it first. It's also exactly why ISC Square weights this heaviest. I would not be surprised if you saw 50 plus questions just on information security governance and risk management. So very, very testable. Okay, This is long-term strategic focus for the organization. Very testable. Now the next domain, operation security, nowhere near as testable. You might see 15, 10, 15 questions on OPSEC, and this is a much short, more short-term focus. Operation security is about those day-to-day -day sort of things that we're concerned about in information security. Providing redundancy of data, high availability, monitoring the network, um, uh, some sort of high-end ideas like um, trusted recovery. So not nearly as testable. Now, cryptography, chapter three, very, very testable. I would probably say 25 questions on crypto, maybe even more. Uh, you don't have to get really deep under the hood. You don't need a doctorate in cryptography, but you do need a very uh, sound foundational understanding, symmetric versus asymmetric cryptography, how the two of them work in a hybrid environment, how we get the best of both worlds. But not just understanding the basics, but how are we going to implement that? What is IPsec? for instance. Well, it's obviously IP security, but it's based on providing cryptographic services. What about SSL or TLS, and we want secure financial transactions across the web? What about secure email? So not just the basics of how it works, but also how we're going to implement it. Very testable. I would put this in the top five, and I'll let you know which ones are in the top five. Certainly, uh, most testable information security governance and risk management, crypto also. Access control, that's a top five item as well. Um, access control are all the ways we regulate what a subject can do with an object. So the subject being some sort of, pa of active entity. I'm a subject, and if I go to access a folder, I'm being active. 
The folder is passive, that's the object. So what a subject can do with an object is all under access control, and not just what they can do, but how we're going to regulate that. Should I have access to all folders, all printers, all rooms in my building? No, and the way we keep that from happening is through access control. Okay, that's in the top five. Probably the single least testable topic on the exam, physical security. Um, quite honestly with you, I don't even remember having a single physical security question on my exam. I'm sure that I did, I had to have. But what that tells me is if I walk out of the exam, uh, the exam environment and I think, God, what questions did I have on physical security and I can't come up with any, that tells you that there were not a lot and it tells you there was nothing of really extreme complexity or difficulty. This is very much a fact-based chapter. There's not a lot of concepts here. This is the type of chapter where you go, okay, I need an eight-foot fence to deter a determined intruder. I want a Class C fire extinguisher. I'm probably going to use an electromechanical um, intrusion detection system or burglar alarm. So a lot of facts with this chapter, not one you're going to spend a ton of time with, though. Okay, I'd probably rank that about 10 in testability. Now, we move on to the telecommunications and network security domain. Very, very testable. It's in the top five. And just a word to the wise, if you are not a network person, you will not become a network person after six hours of lecture. So what that's going to tell you is that if this is going to be a weak area for you, now, a lot of times people come to this class with a very strong background in telecommunications. You don't have to have a strong background here to be successful, but it doesn't hurt. If you're not a telecom network person, honestly, the best thing that I can recommend is that you pick, pick up a little supplementary book. Obviously, I'll cover this in the depth that's appropriate for the exam, but I'm going to make certain assumptions, like you know the purpose of a protocol, you understand uh, you know, some of the hub, switch, router, repeater, gateway, what some of those different elements are. So, uh, and even though we'll cover that, it'll be at a high level. You may want to get uh, a, another supplementary book for this just to help you out. The other thing is telecommunications feels like alphabet soup. I've got all sorts of uh, uh, protocols and they all sound alike and they all do something different. So I would strongly recommend a little supplementary material. I don't generally endorse books as a rule un unless it's very meaningful to me. Uh, and even when I do recommend, I very rarely recommend the For Dummies book. I will tell you that Networking for Dummies is a good, solid little book that would catch you up. Okay, so I'll just throw that out there. But telecommunications is going to be in the top five. All right, another chapter that's not heavily testable is uh, legal, ethics, and investigations. One of the things that ISC Square is pushing towards is becoming an internationally known exam, and they really have uh, crossed that barrier pretty well. So they're getting away from a lot of U.S. laws. You're not going to be grilled on Graham Leach Bliley or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or uh, the Kennedy Kassenbaum Act, which led to HIPAA and all those things. What you are going to see is you're going to see uh, a handful of questions on ethics, and here's a tip. You, by the time you sit this exam, will have already signed the ISC Square Code of Ethics. Might as well read it, okay? So you'll have a handful of questions there. Forensic investigations. You don't have to be a forensic scientist for this, but you do have to follow some sound foundational principles of, of forensics and investigations, and the number one rule being evidence collection should not modify the evidence. So sometimes your job in investigations is simply to isolate the area and call a, a party that's better trained to preserve and collect evidence. We'll talk about all that, but just to give you a feel for that chapter, very low in testability. Honestly, physical and legal, hand in hand, they're at about nine and 10. Okay? I, would be, I would say maybe 10 questions between both of those domains total. All right, chapter eight, huge, huge, huge right up there with information security governance and risk management. Some people tell me business continuity is first, some tell me risk management's first, the bottom line is they're both huge. From my personal experience, when I took this exam, the first time I took it, and I've taken it three times, I just wanna go on record as saying I passed it the first time, each time, 
I don't want you guys panicking, thinking, oh my gosh, how are we going to pass it if the instructor couldn't? But what I've done is I've tried to take it uh, when they have um, modified it and when they go to a new version, because as an instructor, I want to make sure I'm teaching to the current version of the exam. So I've taken it three times, the most recent time back in June. But the first time I took this, which was back with version three, so maybe seven, eight, nine years ago, whenever that was, I actually got to question 25 and I shut my booklet to make sure I had signed up for the right exam. And the reason for that is my first 25 questions were nothing but business continuity and disaster recovery. And I thought maybe I'd signed up for a BCP exam. Um, the reason for that is every decision we make starts with risk management and marches towards the continuity of the business because what it's ultimately about is do we keep the business going and how okay so huge in testability huge 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 this and this chapter one and chapter eight are both i would put right around one and two all right software development security this is in the bottom five but honestly it's on its way up uh, we're seeing more and more questions as we should because ultimately where are our vulnerabilities what are we protecting where are our weaknesses well our weaknesses are in the software and our weaknesses are in the software because we're not writing secure code and until we start writing secure code we're going to continue to have these weaknesses also you know in this chapter we'll focus on databases and database security why well why'd you rob the bank that's where the money is right so why are we attacking databases that's where the data is and that's what is valuable to attackers all right uh, the last chapter security architecture and design if you've done any reading ahead of class if you've done any independent study for CISSP you've probably come across uh, security models like Bell LaPodula, Biba, Clark Wilson, Brewer Nash that's in the security architecture and design chapter um, also specifically pieces of evaluation criteria that the government or other agencies would use to determine whether or not a system would meet our needs. So security architecture and design focuses on building systems securely using the security models that are already in existence to build a secure system and then how do we evaluate to determine whether or not we've built a secure system. This will also focus on certification and accreditation and certainly if you've done any work in the government you're familiar with that. You may have worked with NIACAP or risk management framework or even DIACAP when it was popular or DITSCAP you can go back you know several iterations but that's what we're going to be covering in this chapter. So once again, the 10 domains that we're going to cover or that we're going to cover on a chapter by chapter basis, not all domains are created equal. So please make sure you know when you're studying for this exam how to spend the time appropriately.